Well, um, today we're continuing with a series of messages out of John chapter 15, if you'd like to turn to that. John chapter 15, entitled Remain or uh, Remaining in Christ, uh, as Jesus is going to talk about the fruit that remaining in him bears, uh, as he's going to tell us how we can have abundant joy, contentment, and purpose. And so I, I'd like us to begin our time together today by looking once again at our theme verse out of John's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 5. And uh, which says, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you can bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what, church? Nothing. You can do nothing. So at first glance, though, that might sound like a confusing phrase, uh, just saying, remain in me okay it's not something we would normally say every day remain in me you know but but we've been unfolding this chapter now for the past three weeks and so hopefully you're beginning not only understand but embrace that phrase remain in me but we've been unfolding this chapter uh, for the past uh, number of weeks and and we've learned that the word remain it means to stay connected to stay connected it means to abide it means to be in uh, permanent residence and that's what's taking place before the disciples eyes I mean, Jesus is, is displaying that for him as, as he resides in his Father, as he abides with God through the Holy Spirit. And now he's instructing his disciples that, that this is what they're supposed to be, this is what they're supposed to be doing going forward as leaders of God's mission to change the world. They are, I mean, the key is they are to remain in Jesus, the true vine, uh, just as he remained in his Father. So, uh, for three weeks now, we've talked about Jesus, as in Jesus is the life-giving true vine. We are the branches living the branch life, okay? And, and we've been reminded that to live the branch life is to stay firmly and deeply connected to the vine, who is Jesus, uh, for unexpected storms are bound to come along, right? And, and, uh, and, and leave, leave some separated from the vine, which, they, you know, then they become sticks, or we said dead sticks, but a vibrant branch that is alive and connected, has a lot more staying power. So in John 15, it's all about living an unexplainable life, unexplainable because Jesus has made it clear that without him, they can do what, church? They can do nothing. Okay, in other words, living the branch life, it's about doing what we cannot do on our own. And it's about becoming who we would never be on our own. But in order for you and I to become God's best version, okay, you have to remain intimately connected to Jesus, who is our source. So we should also note here, uh, uh, you know, that when I stop, like for instance, when I stop depending on the true vine, or when I take a detour from the vine, or maybe make a break from the vine, it always leads to dishonoring, disappointing God. Okay, sometimes it's my selfishness, sometimes it's my recklessness, sometimes it's my rebellion. But no, no matter what it is, it always comes back to my independent pride because I, like, I don't need the vine. I, I can do it without the vine, you know. But the first step in remaining, I think, is coming to the realization that what Jesus speaks is the truth. For when Jesus says this, he speaks truth. For Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Okay, you can, apart from me, you can, and honestly, friends, that's, that's why he keeps repeating it as he continues to tell us over and over again, 11 times in 10 verses, to remain in him. Now, someone might ask, why does Jesus repeat that phrase, remaining, so many times? Like, like a, well, the, we know the answer to that one already, right? Like, when someone repeats something that many times, it means what, church? It's important, but I also think because, well, because the disciples were an awful lot like us, and sometimes they're slow to catch on, and repetition is used by a teacher not only to indicate importance, but also in order to kind of get the point to stick, right? Okay, to drive it home, to make certain that you get it. And the disciples are going to need that reminder to remain because things are going to get real chaotic in a matter of just hours because Judas has already gone his way to portray Jesus and, and, and what they will experience. And I mean, it's going to get real chaotic and real challenging. So he wants them to stay connected. He's driving this thing home because he needs them to stay connected to him. So if you would turn in your Bible or Bible app to John 15, if you haven't already, we're going to look at verses 9 through 13 and it's going to reveal the fruit that will flow out of our lives if we will only remain in him so let's pick up where we left off last week in john 15 we're going to start with verse 9 and again this is jesus speaking to his disciples he says i have loved you even as the father has loved me 
remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. So Jesus is the uh, is with the disciples in John chapter 15, and he reminds them that following him will bring about troubles, okay? And, and he has spoken the same thing, that in this life you will have troubles and trials. But he assures them that connecting to him will produce a rooted life, a secure life, regardless of the storms that they may encounter. They won't be disconnected if they stay deeply rooted. Now, you say, okay, Mark, so why do you want me to remain in Jesus? Well, thus far, we've been talking about that the way you know that you're a true branch, a true disciple of Jesus, is you bear fruit, right? That's how you can tell a true branch. They bear fruit. But thus far, we've not discussed what kind of fruit that actually is, okay? What kind of fruit that, I mean, if you were to look at it, what's it look like, okay? And these verses that we're about to read and, and look at, they make it clear that there are like three positive and significant attributes or three types of fruit that will be produced in your life if you remain in him, if you stay connected to him. By faithfully remaining, you now will be eligible or able to produce this kind of fruit. Okay, so here's, here's the first one for you note takers. If you're remaining in Christ, then love should naturally and regularly flow out of your life. Okay, so, so love is the first attribute that's promised to those who remain in Christ. So look with me again at verse 9 and 10. It says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So Jesus is saying here, in verse 9, he's saying, hey, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. In other words, he has set us an example, right? He has set us an example. Notice that Jesus doesn't say that everyone you love is going to love you, right? Because, you know, like when someone loves you and is kind to you and is good to you, it's easy to love them, right? But then there's those other people that are not so easy, okay? That's what makes love so difficult. And that's why just a couple of chapters earlier in John chapter 13, Jesus says, love is what will make Christians distinctive from everyone else. It's what sets you apart. And not, the, not when you love people who love you, but when you love people who don't love you, okay? That's what sets you apart, okay? And Jesus keeps emphasizing the word remain, and it's all about connection first and then production second. We talked about that, I think, in week one, okay? That, that you can't do it the other way around. You can't focus on production and think that leads to connection. It's connection first, and then comes production, or then comes the fruit. And so it's just important that we don't get that order switched up. Anyway, case in point, in 1 Corinthians 14, when, when it starts on, uh, chapter 14 is that chapter you know, of Corinthians that, that deals with all the spiritual gifts. And that whole thing starts with the gifts of the Spirit, it says. It begins with this phrase, follow the way of love right? Follow the way of love. And you read through that entire passage, and if you want those gifts, what it's really saying is if you want those gifts to impact the common good of the world and the church and its mission, you've got to start with love. You've got to follow the way of love. Otherwise, it goes on until you're done with uh, those chapters. It says it's worthless, okay? It's of no value, okay? So here's the point. When we connect to Jesus, we will follow him and follow his example. It's then that Jesus will flow through our lives because following leads to flowing, all right, following leads to flowing. That's the pattern. That's the process that it takes because it's his love that's getting it done. It's his love, the love of the true vine that flows through the branches through us and overflows onto others. And some, sometimes we show our love through our tenderness and our grace, okay, our kindness. And sometimes we show our love through truthfulness, okay, truth with grace, right? You know, I, I don't remember exactly when this was thinking about this past week, but it involved my two of our grandchildren, our youngest daughter's twins, Jack and Luke, who are now about two and a half years old. But this was like a year or so ago, maybe when they were one and a half years old, something like that. I'm not really sure, but it, it began with Luke, okay? One day I was playing with the boys down on the floor, kind of roughhousing, which is the way they like to play. And, and it was Luke who kind of landed on my belly, and then he stopped and reflected for a minute. He said, Pappy, you squishy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you squishy, you got a big belly, he said, and, and I could tell he was impressed. 
He was. <laughs> he was. So much so, he calls his brother Jackal and goes, look, Pappy's squishy. Okay, and so then they, you know, what that means, that's an invitation. Like, I, they acted like I was some sort of a landing pad, you know? And, uh, and it kind of hurt my feelings when they said that. And I said to myself, oh, it's no big deal. They're just little boys. That's what little boys do, you know? I didn't think, I mean, I'm not going to hold it against them. But then I noticed across the room, my daughter Cassie was having a good time with that. And Grammy was a close second. And to be honest with you, I don't think they were too loving. Okay, truthful maybe, but not very loving. But no matter, I extended grace, didn't retaliate at all. And then I turned back to these two little boys and I said, hey, boys, show Pappy your bellies. You know, and so they lifted their shirts and blew up their bellies as best they could. And they were as proud as could be of those bellies. And I praised them over and over again. They have fantastic, awesome bellies, boys. You know, and mommy's going like, pull your shirt down, pull your Well, no, show me your belly. And they're showing the belly, you know. And mommy and Grammy weren't nearly as entertained as the boys and I were. But that was a fairly long time ago. But what reminded me of it this past week uh, was we were having a, well, maybe it was the week before, we were having a birthday party for Margie up at Cassie's house, and all that was good, and the kids and Margie were loving it, and there was this moment, though, when we were playing in the boys, with the boys and such, and th this time, uh, I think it was Jack, but for whatever reason, he, I, there was no reason, all of a sudden, he just lifts his shirt, exposing his belly to all its glory, and he did his best imitation of a dinosaur roar, roar you know, and mom's like, put the shirt down, but I'm going like, oh, that Jack, that's an awesome belly, let's see it again, and we just did it over and over, all truth, spoken in love. Here in John chapter 15, we learn that if we remain attached to the vine, to Jesus, then his love will naturally flow, and they were naturally flowing, you know, that's just boys, but uh, here, here are the same for us, <coughs> and it becomes normal, and it becomes a natural expression when, when you've experienced God's love. And the early Christians were known for that kind of love. And let me, let me kind of back that claim up for you. <clears throat> there was this uh, second century historian by the name of uh, Aristides. And Aristides was commissioned by the Roman emperor to give a report on the Christian community. And to tell him exactly who the Christians were and, and what they were like. Okay, And here are the findings. They've been preserved over time. Here are the findings of Aristides, uh, what he wrote to the emperor in 137 AD. He writes this. And there's a whole list here. He says, they show love to their neighbors. They show love to their neighbors. They do not do to one another what they would not have done to themselves. They speak gently to those who oppose them, and in this way, they make them their friends. It has become their passion to do good to their enemies. They live in the awareness of their smallness. Every one of them who has anything gives on grudgingly to the one who has nothing. If they see a traveling stranger, they bring him under their roof and they rejoice over him as over a real brother, for they know they are brothers in God. If anyone among them is poor or comes into want while they themselves have nothing to spare, they will fast for two or three days for him, and in this way they can supply any poor man with the food that he needs. This, O emperor, is the rule of life of the Christians, and this is their manner of life. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, they were known for their love. And I, I think, about, think about this for a minute. These Christians did not even have the benefit of the written New Testament compiled for them yet. They did not have that yet. All they had to go on was that this Jesus, who, who is the one who came back from the dead, had told them, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And there was nothing new about loving others, but what made this new was the live as I have loved you part. And when Jesus first said that to his disciples, he, he hadn't even laid down his life yet, right? He hadn't even laid down his life as, as, a, as a higher rung, the ultimate rung. Now, what, what we witness so often in our society is anything but love, I think. I mean, the political divide, the racial divide, the tension over opposing opinions, and none of that seems to be subsiding all that much, and with a presidential election on the horizon, I don't think it's too wild of a speculation to say it could get worse, okay? As one side tries to impose or force its will on the other. And listen, friends, we spoke this a couple weeks ago. The answer is not a political vine. It's not going to fix it. It's, it's not a vine of position, of great position, that's going to heal, okay? No, there's only one vine that can solve our woes, and it's the one that pours out love from the cross, from the cross, and says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
I mean, Jesus is saying, and, and, I, and, and it will take love. That's what he's saying. It's going to take love. Undeserved, uncomfortable, unconditional, unlimited love. A love that's only possible when you remain in Christ. It's it. You can't do it. Without him, we are what? Nothing. And we can do nothing, okay? Only with him. And, and I get that, that we have a season that there's a... I mean, in Matthew 24, 12, he says this. Because of the increase of wickedness, this is our, this is our enemy, Okay? Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, he says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Well, that speaks to our time, doesn't it? Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And I get that because we live in a season where there's a temptation for love to grow cold. There's a temptation that when Satan intimidates and evil escalates and a culture deteriorates, there's a real temptation for our love, our love, to grow cold, okay? Uh, to, for us to pull back and begin to look at people who are believe differently and vote differently, for us to look at them differently, okay? There's this temptation to be selective or to start holding back and saying, well, I'll serve this person, but I won't love this one, or I'll love this person, but I won't serve that one. And Jesus says, and this is paraphrased, if you ever find yourself living in a season just like that, you'll be tempted to hold back your love. But I'm telling you, love. Dive in and love. And he says, you need to love people as I have loved you. And the very next day after he says that, while hanging on a cross, I mean, he will pray to his father above, who, by the way, is the judge of all, okay? And here's what he'll say. He will pray on behalf of others, those enemies of his father, forgive them, for they know what, not what they're doing. So rather than revenge, which he could ask, he prays for mercy. And instead of condemnation, he prays for restoration. Look again with me at our text. In verses 10 and 11, Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And that leads us to the second attribute or our second fruit. Uh, the first was love. The second one is joy. Okay, joy. Think of this. If you're remaining in Christ, then joy should be evident in your life in the good times and in the bad times, okay? It shouldn't matter what's going on in your life. The joy of the Lord should still be evident in your life, and that's the very joy that uh, will be the thing about you that shows other people that you're in Christ, that you're attached to the vine. It'll set you apart, okay? Jesus promised peace back in John 14 and John 15. He promises joy, and, and we are to be obedient to the Lord, which is how we show love, okay? And so when, I mean, when we're obedient and we're remaining in, and that's important to him, and then the natural response or the byproduct, maybe I should say, by remaining in him and obeying him is joy, okay? Not just joy, but abundant joy, overflowing joy, he says. And so there's this progression of sorts. So if we could put, put that scripture back up again, uh, verses 10 and 11, let's check it out. It says, when you obey my commands, you remain in my love, okay? You remain in my life. So that's very important to Jesus for us to make certain that we are serious and sincere about remaining in him. We'll obey him, okay? And we'll obey what he's commanded us. So if you've ever wondered what God's love language is, by the way, it's love. It's obedience, okay? It's, it's obedience. Now, now look at verse 11 and see the progression. Jesus says, I have told you these things so that you be filled with my joy. You'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. See, see the progression there from him to, to you? That's the progression that naturally flows out from you. Okay, there's a purpose behind this because I've challenged you, Jesus is saying, and I'm expecting you to be obedient and to love others I have loved you. And then to do that, the byproduct of your life becomes overflowing joy, overflowing joy. Now, maybe this will help um, make it more sense, uh, but we live in a whole different age of technology now, don't we? I mean, like things have changed, okay? And uh, take, for instance, cell phones. They can take a picture and record a video in color at, to great, you know, great pictures. You can even, you know, Photoshop and the whole nine yards. I mean, you got the sound, everything, okay? Uh, come a long way since Polaroid pictures that you had to wait 30 seconds for that lousy image to show up, you know? And uh, so you just think about that, okay? Those pictures weren't exactly the sharpest pictures. But today, well, you know, uh, what that means is, is hardly a day goes by without uh, videos or pictures of our grandchildren being sent to us in a family text. And here's the point. Most of them, the pictures are videos of just the kind that, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Okay, like, like um, it's those boys being boys, and, uh, and Cassie will send them to us, and she'll say, this is my life. 
laugh out loud, and it's got that smiley face that's smiling, but tears coming out, you know? But every once in a while, I mean, that's the bulk of them, and they're just being kids. But every once in a while, we get a picture or a video where the kids are cleaning their room. <laughs> Not often, but one where they're cleaning the room, or Beck and Sam are sitting, standing at the, uh, at the kitchen counter doing the evening dishes. Or this week, it was all the kids individually reciting their memory verse from Galatians 5.22 on video and, and uh, sending it to us. But, but when we get those kind, the comments are more like this. We respond back to, hey, are those really your kids? Did you rent those kids or what? Because those aren't your kids. And, uh, or, or, you know, or she, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go to them. Oh, that's not you. That's not you. That's not you. And they go, yes, it is, Pappy. Yes, it is. We did that, Pappy. And we say, well, well done. That's awesome. You know, that's, that's great. And in that moment when you finally praise them, You'll, yeah, I mean, I, I take it they see a little smile creep across our faces, and somehow that smile gets transferred to their faces. And you see, they just wanted to please their parents. They just wanted to please their grandparents. But listen, friends, here's what's happening. Not in perfection, okay, because it's a process, okay? But what's happening is at a very early age in the process, they are discovering that obedience has a double benefit, okay? First, it brought their parents joy, and secondly, it brings them joy, okay? And the same is true when you obey your heavenly Father. It leads to overflowing joy. It leads to contentment. And before we leave this section, let me just point out that there's a qualifier, though, okay? And here it is. Because when I say obedience leads to joy, I'm not talking about giddiness, all right? Uh, uh, and I'm not talking about happiness, because there's a difference between happiness and joy. For happiness is based on happenings, okay? It's dictated by circumstances, but joy's different. Uh, because joy comes from within, it comes from a deeper place, and while joy may accompany happiness, and often does, okay, it doesn't necessarily. It goes beyond the excitement that, of a pay raise. It goes beyond the excitement of a trophy at the end of the season or an A or a test or that feeling you get after you've had this uh, first date with that special someone, because joy runs deeper than that. Joy, it lasts. It has staying power even through tough times. Well, the third attribute that flows out of the Christ follower is, if they'll remain in him, is sacrifice. And that one seems odd. Like, sacrifice? Really? That's a good thing? Right? I mean, love, joy, we like those. But sacrifice? Okay. If you're remaining in Christ, you'll be willing to sacrifice anything for him. Okay? The first attribute or fruit that flows out of remaining is love. The second is joy. The third is sacrifice. And we as Christ followers, we sacrifice in so many different ways. Uh, we sacrifice through our giving of tithes and offerings. We sacrifice through our giving of our spiritual gifts, through our sharing of possessions, through the investing of time into other people. Sacrifice takes on many different forms. I I've shared this before, uh, but years ago, uh, while our son-in-law Jack was still with us, and it was just uh, nine years since he's passed this, this past weekend, but uh, so we were, we were thinking about him this week, and, but we were, uh, n nine years ago, maybe, maybe 10, 11 years ago, we were visiting uh, he and our Sherry uh, um, in Bristol, Tennessee, our daughter Sherry, and it, it was the fall of the year, and the reason I know is because we went to church with them on that Sunday, and at church they were passing out those Operation Christmas boxes, okay, like we do every year. And Bob Robertson, who was the senior minister of the church that year, was standing up front at the end of the service, and after he was making announcements, much like we do here at the end of the service, okay, and he was announcing that those Christmas shoe boxes were available in the foyers, and then he said uh, something along the lines of, being a Christian can be hard at times, like sacrificial, I took it. Because sometimes it means dragging yourself out of bed on a Sunday morning when you'd rather stay home and sleep in. Like today, maybe, you know? And uh, sometimes it means housing the visiting missionary in your home when you'd rather someone else do it, okay? Sometimes it means sacrificing something you want to spend your money on for yourself and taking it and buying those Operation Christmas boxes. And then he said, listen, friends, on your way out today, make the sacrifice. Don't just take one box. Take two. Take three. Take however many it takes to get to sacrifice. Right? And, you know, I know how that goes. Because sometimes we're like, well, I have a lot of God, so much money. And so I'll just take some out of here and do this. Okay? And that's not what he's talking about. That's not hard. You're already doing that. Right? He's saying... Take however many boxes it takes until it's hard. And then you've given something, right? 
Why is that? Because the way of Jesus is hard. And when you're invited into Jesus' life and you're invited to remain with him and in him, it becomes a life of sacrifice, of of sharing resources, of investing time into other people's lives. Uh, But listen, friends, in that sacrifice, if you open yourself up, it will cost you something. It will. It might cost you some time. It might cost you some money. Sometimes it might cost you a friendship. But the cost is priceless compared to what's on the other side of it. In fact, Jesus is going to focus on intentional sacrifice not just on accidental sometimes we you know we sacrifice but it wasn't planned it just happened on us okay he's talking about intentional sacrifice for he's going to talk about the ultimate sacrifice and and little did he the disciples know that jesus words would play out the very next day or even that same day it would begin but he shows the extent of his love in doing so look look with me at what jesus says next our last two verses 12 and 13 jesus says this to these disciples this is my commandment love each other in the same way i have loved you well how have you loved us lord there is no greater here's how he's going to tell him there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends and jesus just blows out of the water our everyday attempts at sacrifice right and in very certain terms he states that the ultimate display of love is being willing to give up your life for someone else's the point is a life marked by jesus will always be a life shaped by sacrifice okay and jesus practiced what he preaches the very next day the great shepherd will lay down his life for his sheep and please don't miss this because in jesus world not only are his methods upside down but so are the results okay for when he chose the cross and he laid down his life it brought him incredible joy okay when he laid down his life, it brought him incredible joy. Uh, and you ask, well, how could, how could that bring him joy on, on the cross? How's that working, you know? I mean, what could bring him joy here on planet Earth in anything, okay, that he didn't already have in heaven before he came to Earth? Okay, and the answer might surprise you, but in Hebrews 12, 2, it says it like this. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and protector, or perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see it? It's like it says, who for the joy set before him. So what's the writer making reference to? What's the joy that's been set before him? What's this joy that Jesus is is talking about? I mean, what could motivate him down here on earth that didn't motivate him in heaven? What did he have down here that he couldn't have up there, you know? Because up in heaven, he had authority. Up in heaven, he had uh, beings worshiping him, and he had a throne and authority. He had everything, okay? So what did earth have that heaven didn't have, okay? What was the joy that was set before him? And the one thing that he didn't have in heaven was you, us, and that's it. And so he came so that you could experience forgiveness and peace and joy and salvation. And so here's, here's how all that joy works, church family. If you want to boil it all down, if you became his joy, then he can become your joy. And that's the challenge that's right here before us this morning, each and every one of us. Jesus says, love one another in the way I have loved you. And your joy, not just his joy, but your joy will overflow. And so I say to all God's people this morning, remain. Remain and you will bear fruit much fruit let's pray father we give thanks today for our lord and savior jesus christ and all that he means to us lord and uh, we especially give thanks each and every lord's day that seeing the joy set before him meaning the cross for our benefit he stood up and gave it he loved us as his father loved us And so, Lord, we come this morning lifting up the name of Jesus, praising Jesus. Lord, And we pray that we would stay connected. We know through the Holy Spirit that uh, is is the, the way that he works through us, Lord, that it's Christ in us that the world sees that makes us distinctive. But without him, we are nothing, and we can do nothing. So, Lord, I pray, like those early Christians, we would see our smallness, and see his greatness, Lord, and 
and uh, allow that to flow through us that we might be productive, that it might bring glory to Jesus, that it might advance his kingdom. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.